There's so many little steps. Sometimes I feel like Facebook doesn't. Alrighty, well, I'm going to go ahead and do my little spiel first. So, Marissa, if you want to pull up your, just go ahead and share your screen. Let me, oh, it minimized again. <laughs> All right. This worked perfectly when we tried it out like 15 minutes ago. Yep. <laughs> Can you guys see that? Nope. No. Okay. All right. That's that's okay. We got it. <laughs> Share screen. All right. All right. There we go. Okay. Hey, there we go. <laughs> All righty, everybody. Um, once again, welcome. My name is Stacy. I'm the executive director with Bucks County Audubon Society. Um, thank you for joining us for our Nature in Your Backyard um, um, Lunch and Learn series. Um, as I said, this is all leading up to our wonderful, fabulous bio blitz at the end of the October. Um, and we're already so far through. We only have a couple of them after this week. Um, but I will let you all know um, that once we finish up this series and have our bio blitz, we're going to be starting a new Lunch and Learn series um, starting on October 28th. That's going to be all about sustainability. Um, so we've got some great speakers to talk about um, some different aspects of sustainability. So that should be a really great one as well. Same exact format as this one. Um, and again, we'll make sure that we are recording them and posting them up for people to, um, to watch at later times as well. Um, so we're really excited to have you all here. Um, as I mentioned uh, briefly before, um, Marissa Jacobs, who is um, one of the staff members at Flux uh, Audubon, she is our, I think it's strong, she's our communication and program coordinator, I believe that's the right title, um, and she does a lot of our social media, so if you've interacted with people online, it's probably Marissa that you've been interacting with, um, and Marissa loves mammals, she's um, studied them in college and is excited to do um, the chance to use a little bit deeper knowledge than she usually gets when she's um, teaching the kids. So um, I'm going to turn it over to her um, and hope everyone enjoys. Okay, so as Stacy said, I studied mammals in college in a mammalogy unit um, with my wildlife conservation degree. And the whole entire semester, the whole entire class was just about mammals. So I tried to take my semester's worth of knowledge and cram it into this hour. Um, but this is by no means the extent of these wonderful creatures. So if you have questions, um, you can let me know in the chat. Stacy's gonna be watching that. Um, and on Facebook, you can also, if you're on Facebook watching, or if you're watching this later, you can feel free to email me with any questions that you have as well. All right, so mammals, the first thing that we think of when we think of what a mammal is, is they have fur. That's the thing whenever I'm talking to kids or adults, common knowledge that mammals have fur. There are three types of fibers or furs that different mammals can have. The first being your standard fur and the difference between fur and hair, what we have or what some sort of special dogs have, um, a lot of the hypoallergenic dogs have this as well, is that fur will only grow to a certain limit. Once it's grown to that limit, it's fulfilled its usefulness and will either stay there for a while or it will be shed. And we all know with dogs or cats, we see fur all over the place being shed. Hair, on the other hand, as we can all attest to, 
keeps growing for as long as you let it. We have to always cut it. That's not the case with a lot of different mammals, especially out in the wild. We're not seeing squirrels with hair longer than mine. That's craziness. So that's one of the ways that we can tell a difference between those two fur and hair types. The third type of fiber is wool. This is not classified as fur or as hair. Um, so if you think of sheep or alpacas, things like that, um, one of the major differences between fur and hair and wool is that it will not only grow continuously, but it produces a special type of oil called lanolin. And if we look at the ingredient bottles of really fancy um, lotions or hand creams, they might have lanolin in them. If you're ever at a farm festival or you have your own sheep, if you scrunch your hands all in there, for it'll come out very soft and you can almost feel that oil on your skin. Fur and hair, they produce a type of oil called sebum, but it's not nearly in the extent that wool produces lanolin. And in the bottom here, you can see the different types of strands under a microscope. So this is one way that scientists actually will identify mammals is by looking at tufts of fur or hair under microscopes if they don't have other identifying features available. We have, in the category of fur, we have some different types. The first being the brassy, which is really just whiskers, a fancy word for whiskers. And these are specialized hairs or fur strands that actually have sensory receptors that connect to the nervous system of the animal. So they're able to get a better feel of their environment or their location, their food sources, based on these protruding hairs out of their face. Um, for example, deer will actually be able to use whiskers located on the bottom of their chin to figure out how far from the ground they are, because that's something deer need to know, and be able to figure out what sort of food is right beneath their faces. Then we have guard hairs, which in this middle picture, you see the, the dark brown and the tan colored fur. Then you see these long white strands on the top. Those white strands are the guard hairs and they are basic protection. Then you have your under hair, which in the middle picture would be that tan or that dark brown. And those under hairs, in the third picture, that fluffy, fluffy fiber, that provides insulation, which as warm-blooded animals is super, super important. And we'll talk a little bit more about quote-unquote warm-bloodedness. So some cool trivia for you about fur or hair is for semi-aquatic animals, things that live both on land and on water, not straight up marine mammals like whales, they really, really, really need to be able to insulate themselves really well being in a colder environment like water. So sea otters and river otters can have up to 1 million hairs per square inch. So in this little itty bitty tiny little space, you can have 1 million follicles, which is just absolutely incredible. Um, human hair, if you think of our own hair, we don't have a layer of extra fluff under each strand. And that's because our hair is a bizarre blend between guard hairs and under hairs, providing both protection and insulation for us. And then small mammals like voles or mice or shrews, because their body temperature is fluctuating so quickly. These little itty bitty guys are running around like crazy people searching for food. And as they're running, they're expending energy. And then they find their food and it energizes them for a little bit, gives them heat. But they're so small that their body temperature fluctuates constantly. So they have extremely, extremely durable fur, and they rely heavily on it. 
then we can think about what color the animal is and how important their fur or hair coloration is. And different patterns or colors will mean different things to predators, to potential mates, to others of their community. So first off, we've got black and white. If you have that sort of coloration, um, it's like a big shout, a warning. Hey, I am super smelly or I'm really toxic. And we can first think of that super smelly creature is the skunk who is shouting to everyone, I smell bad, don't make me smell bad. And then it can also be a warning of toxicity. So not as local, but the zebra being a black and white striped animal, it is believed that that sort of coloration deters the tsetse flies that can spread diseases. So excellent use of that sort of coloration. If you, uh, grooming is really important. So if you are a poorly groomed animal, it's usually a sign to the rest of your community or to potential mates that you're sick, you don't have the energy to maintain your fur, um, you may have disease that's causing your fur to fall off like mange. And so it's a signal to other animals that, whoa, that one is not feeling good either. I don't want to meet with that because there's a chance that it's a genetic condition and I don't want to pass those genes down to the next generation. I don't want those to be spread or they're really sick and we should stay away because I don't want to get sick. And then camouflage is a fur coloration. And here in this image of the fawn, you can see something called cryptic coloration. And it is kind of confusing for predators who see motion very, very well. And when this fawn is completely still, predators will have a really hard time being able to distinguish between the fawn and the surrounding leaves. The tawny color of their coat matches the leaf litter and those white splotches, while looking very obvious to humans, kind of looks like dappled light shining through a forest canopy to predators. And as long as the fawn doesn't move and it stays in its little ball, predators can almost walk over top of a fawn and not even notice them. So the next feature about mammals after fur being the most commonly known one is that we are quote unquote warm blooded or the fancy science word is endothermic. Endo meaning inside and therm like thermometer is the temperature. So mammals have the ability to maintain that internal body temperature. So whereas reptiles or other creatures that are ectotherms, ecto being outside, relying on external resources for their warmth. Um, we don't really have to worry about if it's a sunny day or if it's a cloudy day, our body temperature is not going to change very much. You can see in this graph, as the ambient or environmental temperature increases, that's when for reptiles, body temperature increases and they have the energy to go do things. Whereas mammals, we kind of stay the same. Obviously, if it's a really hot day, our body temperature is going to increase, but very insignificantly. And going back to fur, fur is kind of one of the ways that it, you know, is able for us to have that steady, stable, internal body temperature. So that insulating effect is very important. Another feature of a mammal is that they give live birth. This is called viviparous, vive meaning like vitality, life. And this is so that the baby stays protected for its term. If we we're hatched out of eggs. If you think of a goose or a reptile, or a bird or a reptile, the mothers often have to stay close to the eggs. If you think of the goose, then the mother has to sit on the eggs to the point where she won't even 
try to go out and find herself food, she relies on a mate to bring the food back because the temperature and the protection of the eggs is so important. As a mammal, we can carry our baby with us and not necessarily have to worry so much about environmental conditions. There are three different kinds of mammals based on how they give birth. And you've got the really weird mammals that are just super bizarre that actually do lay eggs. And these would be the non-local uh, platypus and echidnas. Platypus are just super bizarre. Maybe they're a bird with their bill. Maybe they're a reptile with their weird venom glands. Who knows? They're qualified as a mammal with their fur. Um, and those are called monotremes. Then we've got our marsupials, which locally we can think of the opossum. And exotic, we can think of the koalas or the kangaroos, where they do give birth to live little creatures. Here you can see, um, this is a possum pouch. And there are these tiny little pinkies that they're very small, very, very small and underdeveloped. They're blind, they have no fur, they have no ability to protect themselves. So once they're born, they will crawl towards their mother's pouch where then they drink the super nutritious milk to finish that developmental process. And then we have placental mammals, which are a majority of the mammal species. And these are the mammals that they give the live birth and hypothetically, they are ready to be in the world upon birth. They have finished the developmental process. They're still babies though, so the parents have to protect them a little bit more until the babies learn how to hunt for themselves or protect themselves. But during that time, the mother can provide milk, which is another mammalian trait, which the word mammal itself comes from the Latin word mamma, which means breast for milk production. So baby animals are gonna be drinking this really, really vitamin, mineral, nutrient packed drink to help them finish the development process and to get on their way to becoming adults that can care for themselves. With humans, it takes a little bit longer for the process, but there are some animals that um, within hours, they need to be up and moving and ready to run if a predator is to come and chase them. Now that we know what sort of constitutes a mammal, we can use a couple of different features to identify single mammals. And I do want to make known that many mammals are crepuscular, which means that they're gonna be coming out at dawn or dusk or nocturnal. And just because we don't see them doesn't mean they don't exist. So in order to find those animals, we need to search for them in a different way. So instead of being able to flip over a rock and find a salamander, that's not the same method of looking for mammals. We're going to be focusing on tracks, paw prints, scat or droppings, and bone formation that is left by other predators who just don't want to eat the bones. So the first way to figure out what mammal is around is to look at scatter droppings. And I know this is a lunch and learn and y'all are eating your lunches and talking about scat, super fun. But hopefully you can learn something from these pictures here. Um, you can really use this to help identify mammals by looking at the color, the size and the shape, and then kind of using sticks or tweezers or probes if you're a fancy science person, you can look at the actual digested material inside to figure out, oh, this is what they ate. Well, clearly I can narrow my thoughts from um, all mammals to now I know, oh, it's an herbivore. 
helpful. Scat is the name for poop of a predator, and droppings are little tiny droplets from herbivores. So we're going to look at what is inside of this digested material to kind of help narrow down our scope. So if we've got berries and seeds, we've obviously got an herbivore or a plant eater, or it could be an omnivore. An omnivore is a mammal that eats both plants and animals, so humans, for the most part, unless you're a vegan or vegetarian, you're gonna be an omnivore. If we find tufts of fur, Again, we could be an omnivore with the slight diet of meat or a carnivore as a creature that is going to be primarily or only a meat eater. If we've got fibrous plant matter, strands of grasses, leaves all mushed up, obviously the plant eater or the herbivore or an omnivore that would eat both and digested mush, that brown colored goopy stuff, that is a high, high protein diet as muscle and flesh is able to be digested very easily. So that could be found in omnivores or in carnivores. And here is a wonderful chart for the mammologists out there who just love looking at poop, but poop shape can really help an identifying feature. For example, a red fox, a common local species here, is going to look like a standard dog poop, but it might have a twist at the end. And that can really help distinguish between your neighbor's dog and a fox that went through your backyard. After scat, we can also look at tracks or little paw prints. And here in this picture, we see tiny little, it looks like baby hands, baby human hands that go up this picture. And those are super small. They are maybe, I'm looking at my ruler here, they might be about one inch um, long each one. And that can help tell me that this was a raccoon. I use the size of well, if it was actually the size of a handprint, it might have been a person walking through the woods on their hands and feet, or on their hands. A little strange, but the size helps narrow it down. The number of toes is also important. Looking at, do we see only three toes or three pads that might be on the bottom of a dog or cat foot? Do we see five toes, as in this raccoon here? Do we see visible claw marks? For example, cats, uh, so think locally of bobcats, they have the ability to retract their claws. We can all know this from you know, our pet cats inside. They don't always have their claws out. That's when they are hunting or if a cat is playing and is trying to instigate um, or replicate that hunt feel, that hunt mentality then they would have their claws out. Um, so if we see a very predatory sort of paw print that has those little pads, I call them toe beans, um, and there's no claws, that can help us narrow down that, oh, a cat passed through here. Whereas if there are claw marks, it can help you say that, oh, that's a dog. Canines like fox, coyotes, um, and others in that family don't have the ability to retract their claws, they're gonna be out. And you're gonna see those tiny little dots of the claw marks. And then we can look at so, uh, stride and straddle. Stride is how far um, the bottom print is from the one at the top. And straddle is the side to side distance. Do you see all four legs? or are they walking in such a fashion that it's one foot in front of the other and the paw prints are kind of overlapping. There's a whole bunch of different paw prints out there. The, um, the image on the left with the white background, that's gonna show you the individual paw print um, style, the overall shape of that track. 
So you can really see the dog, the fox, coyote with their claw marks, um, and the cat, like a bobcat, without the claw marks. Um, and then on the right with the tan background, you can see more of that stride in the straddle of each that shows this is how the rabbit jumps. And as it jumps, you're going to see this pattern, this repeated pattern over and over again. And then sometimes you are fortunate enough to find somebody's leftovers, um, sometimes coyotes or fox, they don't, they don't want to eat the bones necessarily, they just want the flesh part. So you can find a skeleton and one way to identify what the lunch was is to look at the bone structures. So the bones that you can look for in particular would be the skull and you would look at the size, the shape of it, the uh, position of the eyes. You could look if there are any available, any jaws or on the upper jaw of the skull to look at the dentition or the teeth to help narrow down, is it an herbivore, a carnivore, or an omnivore? One great identifying feature is if it has antlers. If it's got antlers, we know right away, male white-tailed deer. That's gonna be the only thing with antlers in this exact location. There may be an elk, but that's farther north and west Pennsylvania. You're not really gonna see them here in Bucks County. And then if you find a leg bone, looking at the length of it, the, the size is going to really help you figure out if the leg bone is the size of my leg bone, I know that's not a squirrel. Or if the leg bone is only the size of my little finger, well, I know that's not a coyote. And you can help narrow down from there. With the skull of a predator versus a prey, you can help, if you, if you have the skull in front of you and you look at the position of the eyes, you can immediately distinguish between, oh, this is a prey species or this is a predator species. If the eyes are on the front of the skull, just like ours, our eyes are right in the front here, we are predators, that animal is gonna see motion very quickly we pick up on it easily. If we're out eating at a restaurant and there's a TV going on in the corner, we may not want to watch what's on the TV. We may want to have that conversation, but we can't help but look at it because we're so attracted to motion. It's the same with predators like fox or coyotes or big cats. That's what they see first is motion. If the eyes and eye sockets are on the side of the skull, closer to where their ears would be, that's gonna be a prey species, usually an herbivore. If you have your eyes on the side, you have a better sense of your surrounding. And this diagram here, it shows uh, somebody's pet rabbit, but it's very applicable to any sort of species that is going to have its eyes on the side of the head. Um, you have a very narrow blind spot in front of you, and of course you can't see directly behind you, but you have a much broader field of view where you can sit very, very still and hope that no predator sees you while you're surveying almost your entire surroundings and figuring out, ooh, I have a predator over there. I'm going to sit here and hope that they don't notice me. And if they do, I know that I have a free spot way back there that I can quick zigzag and run towards. So having the eyes on the side of the head really helps to maintain that sort of sense of safety. Then we can look at dentition or the teeth of the jaw bones. Here we have the top is the carnivore and then we have an herbivore and an omnivore. The blue is the incisors, that's gonna be the front sort of flat teeth. Those are going to be in a carnivore, the teeth that kind of immediately grab onto a prey species. Or in an herbivore or an omnivore, it's going to be the teeth that kind of bite into the leaf or the plant 
or for us, our sandwich, things like that. Canines are the orange marked teeth here, and they're going to be your quintessential fangs. These are going to be really good for um, in a carnivore for piercing and holding on to prey. Whereas in herbivores and omnivores, you can see their size is severely reduced. In herbivores, they're so tiny that they don't do as much as it would in a carnivore because that's just not what their diet is based on. Then we see the yellowy color is the premolars, which go along with the brown color, which are the molars in these diagrams. In carnivores, they're very distinct and they are, if you see them, they're more like a scissor shape. They fit together very nicely. These jagged scissor shaped teeth on the top and bottom jaw are called carnasal pairs. And you see the, the pair of them line up perfectly together and these act like scissors to shred and to rip. In herbivores and omnivores, they're nowhere near as pointy and they're made for more grinding. In herbivores, you can also tell their age. It's not necessarily an identifying of what species it is, but you can tell the age by how ground down the premolars and molars are. If they're really, really flat, that is a nice long-lived white-tailed deer, yay. If they're still really sharp um, and have more, you can see this like little jagged points on the molars might have been a younger um, fawn or juvenile. Now we get to the fun part of being aware of where you, the person searching for the mammals, are. If you're in the sort of area that's conducive to having um, raccoons near a body of water, well, you should search for raccoons there probably shouldn't search for other sorts of species when you're in the wrong spot and vice versa. So let's look at the types of homes that they have. First, we've got nests. And creatures like mice love to steal nests. So if you are looking in your bluebird boxes, you may often find at this time of year that mice have moved in. They will steal nests that have been abandoned and continue to line it with fluffy things and leaves and grasses, anything to make them feel cozy, as you can see in the image here. Or there are mammals like squirrels that create leaf nests very high up in the trees. You may see a ball of leaves, of dead leaves. That's a squirrel nest called a dray. If you're walking through the forest and you see some holes or burrows in the ground, you can kind of look at the shape of the burrow or if you look in and it goes down really deep, you can kind of identify who might live there. So dens are used by fox, mainly during the spring breeding season. Outside of that time, they're wandering around. They like to sleep up above ground. They don't need that den as much, but a den is a really great place to raise your young. So if you see a hole that is taller than it is wide, think of how slinky a fox is, not a little fat groundhog, um, you can identify that as a fox den and they are often littered, that entryway is often littered with leftovers like squirrel tails and bones and stuff. Um, then we have cavities like tree cavities or fallen logs that have big hole spaces. These are favorite homes of raccoons. So if you ever see a raccoon climbing a tree, you can sometimes assume that, oh, that's where its home is. Or we often see pictures of little babies poking their heads out of tree hollows. In a cave, you may find bats but only if you're in the cave in the winter. In the summer, bats are gonna find little tiny crevices in trees, in just uh, rocks on the ground, um, or in man-made structures. Like at Bucks Autobahn, we have this tiny slit of a window um, on the side of one of the barn walls, and there's a little bat 
that likes to hang out in that very small slit. But in the winter, when they go to hibernate, they need something a little more stable, secure, and safe. So they're going to be moving to caves or more permanent man-made structures like um, church chimneys, things like that. Then we have burrow systems, and these are long, winding, underground passageways that rabbits and chipmunks and groundhogs and mice love to create. If it's up on a slope, you can assume that that's a rabbit. Rabbits hate the moisture, so they want something well drained. So being on a slope, you have all that runoff, they're not gonna have their den be super wet all the time. At the front of their home, you're gonna see fur tufts, they do their grooming, and also their bathroom breaks are outside of the den. Chipmunks like to have their entrances under pre-existing surfaces like uh, rock clusters, fallen logs, people's porches, things like that because they don't want predators to see where they're going in. But they have hundreds of exit holes all over the place. If it's very shallow, that's probably a hole for just daytime refuge of oh, there's a hawk flying over right now while I'm searching for food. Ooh, quick dart into the hole. The hawk passes, okay, come back out. If it's a deep hole, that's probably going to be the hole that they use for nesting and breeding. It's a little safer. Groundhogs have many hole entrances, but they are pretty large and they are very round. Think these are fat squat animals that need room to wiggle around in. And groundhogs have no problem with stealing abandoned dens and just widening it if necessary. In fact, groundhogs and fox often share the same den. And then we've got mice. And mice will create tiny, tiny little, little holes, very small, and they often block it with debris, with grasses, with leaves, things like that, it almost creates a kind of door so that other predators would completely miss it walking by. I know we went through that really fast and there is no way ever that anyone is expecting you to have all of that information memorized for every single mammal species that is ever found here. So field guides come in handy so much once you've narrowed down and said, okay, I can identify that this is a predator, it likes to also eat berries that I found in this gap, but there was also fur in this gut. So maybe it's an omnivore. You're narrowing your identification down and you can look in a field guide and be able to better identify what exact species you've seen. So these three are personally my favorite field guides. There's tons out there, but the Peterson, Princeton, and Audubon field guides I find are very good. The one issue that you may find is unlike birds, it's really hard to find a field guide that is specific to the Northeast or to Pennsylvania. Most of these field guides are for North America as a whole. Um, here in this Peterson field guide, you can see it's for the continental United States. It's not for um, Central, um, Central America. It's North America and above. But they're still very good. All right, so I have listed 10 fairly commonly cited ones, whether we actually see the animals around or just evidence of them. However, in Bucks County, there are 70 listed mammals. I have the full list um, URL here if people wanted to reference that. Later they can, but we're just gonna go through the 10 to save time. First, we've got a raccoon. Um, and the, the style here is gonna be the same. You're gonna see a picture of the animal, their paw prints, and then scat if there is one. So these guys are omnivores, loving crayfish and snails. So you're often going to see them in forests near bodies of water. All of the pictures of tracks that I have 
are from stream sides where they leave their little muddy paw prints. And raccoons are very unique in their, in their hands. In Powhatan Native American, they're called arukan, um, and that means animal that scratches with hands. They're very unique in the fact that they use their paws extensively to gather food, they wash food, they even wash their own hands. They're very clean in that way. And they're very dexterous using their hands a lot. So that is where the name raccoon comes from. Then we've got our red fox. And here in this track image, you can see those tiny little claw marks of uh, each of the little toe beans or the pads that you can count there. They would have four in their, in their front paws there. They are mainly carnivorous, meaning that they're gonna eat mostly meat, whether it's small mammals or some insects, but you can find berries when berries are in season. So in the um, late summer, early fall, you may see fox scat with more berry, uh, berry matter in it. And their favorite habitat is something called an ecotone, which is just a transition between one habitat and the, and the next. So here in Bucks County, where we have rural budding right up against suburban with, um, we think of Doylestown is very built up, or you have lots of buildings in New Hope here, and then you have lots of forest everywhere. That's gonna be their favorite spot. We are, as humans, we're attracting birds, we're attracting small mammals, things that root through our garbage. So fox have a field day with that, having a buffet and being able to eat a wide variety of food, they've got it all. While they have protection from the woodland area, they don't have to travel very far to get other resources. Some similar species would be a gray fox and then just dogs, smaller dogs. Um, we're not gonna see as many gray fox here in this area. However, in one way to distinguish between the two is a gray fox is generally smaller in size and they have a dark brown stripe that extends from the head all the way down the tip of the tail. We've got white-tailed deer. Um, we see these all over the place and they're gonna prefer forest edges where there's good protection lots of woody brows for them to munch on. So they have pretty distinct footprints being that they're a hooved mammal, meaning that there's only those two solid structures as opposed to more paws. We've got our little brown bat, which again is one of the mammals that just because we don't see them doesn't mean they don't exist here. If you are out from dusk until late at night, you will be, at least where I live in New Hope, you will be swarmed by bats flying around for moths and yummy insects. Um, so they definitely exist here. Little brown bats are about two and a half inches. They're very small and cute. And some similar species would be a hoary bat, which you can distinguish between them by hoary bats have like a silver coat instead of the brown, very similar size though. The big brown bat, which looks like the little brown bat except it's bigger. And the Eastern pipistrelle, which is also known as the tricolor bat. So it's gonna be a bat similar in size, maybe a little bit bigger than the little brown bat, but it's going to have more tans, yellows, and reds in its fur. Then we have our white-footed mouse, and this I discovered is actually listed as the most common PA mammal. So you may see these a lot. And they are huge, huge seed dispersers. They also are uh, fungi lovers, and so they're uh, very important in the spread of a fungi called mycorrhizae, which helps to increase soil health and plant growth. Super cool. Similar species would be a deer mouse and a house mouse. House mice are 
larger and more dark colored all over, even on their tummies. And deer mice are very, very, very similar to the white-footed mouse, um, except their hind feet are a little bit smaller um, and their tail has a more stark bicoloration to it. But that would be something that you would have to use a field guide to really be able to distinguish between the two unless you are, um, are quicker at identifying the white-footed mouse. Then we've got our skunk. Nothing like it in this area. And again, that stark coloration of the white and the black is gonna tell other species, hey, stay away. Uh, don't mess with me, I'll make you smell real bad. And it seems as if they know how bad they smell because they will not spray when they are in enclosed spaces or when they're in their own dens. They don't want the smell to permeate throughout that area. Um, they are omnivorous, so it may look like raccoon scat, uh, very similar in structure. However, skunk is gonna be filled with more insects, like this here, this image is filled with beetle parts. Then we've got the opossum, very adorable, I think, and also extremely important at keeping insect population down. A lot of people don't like them at first because these little guys are opportunistic feeders, meaning they'll eat whatever they can get their little paws on. And that includes carrion and rotten vegetables, rotten fruits, things like that. Um, however, they are some of the cleanest animals spending lots of their time grooming and self-care to the point where if they have a tick on them, they're probably gonna get it and eat it. So these little vacuum cleaners go around the forest vacuuming up tick populations. So having a possum in your backyard can really, really decrease your chance of Lyme disease exposure and just uh, picking up ticks in general. Um, so I have here one possum in a season, one opossum in a season can eat 5,000 ticks by itself. So if you have a family of five in your backyard, that's a lot of ticks that are disappearing, which is great. Another fun fact is here in America, the American opossum is called an opossum. However, in Australia, the species is, they slash the O and it's called a possum just straight possum. We've got our squirrel and these amazing guys are very much responsible for seed dispersion of native oak populations as they forget where their seeds are buried, their acorns are buried, or they bury too much and they don't need that much. Little oak trees pop up all over the place. They can, however, since they aren't going to be hibernating throughout the winter, they are very adept at being able to burrow into the snow, even if it's like a foot deep, um, and still finding the food if they remember where they put it. A similar species would be a fox squirrel, which has a much redder tummy. Um, still the, the gray fur on the back, um, but much redder on the belly and a red squirrel, which is smaller in size than the gray squirrel and completely red. So you wouldn't get confused between a fox squirrel and a red squirrel because it's full, full red. They also, the red squirrels also have little ear tufts. Then we've got our cottontail rabbit and you're pretty much not going to find a different rabbit species in this area Snowshoe hares have been found in Pennsylvania before. However, it's unlikely that you would find any here. Again, just because we don't see them doesn't mean they're not here. But chances are if you see a rabbit, it's the cottontail. You may also see um, a rabbit looking like it's eating its own poop. This is normal. This is perfectly healthy behavior. In fact, it's necessary for their life. They're called coprophagic which means that they're gonna re-eat their poop, kind of like a cow chewing their cud, to re-ingest and um, 
have a more efficient digestive tract to gain those nutrients back in. So a lot of people think that's a diseased rabbit. I need to call the game commission or I need to call a rehabilitator. That's not true. The rabbit's perfectly fine doing its normal rabbit business. Then we've got our groundhog. If you are a gardener, chances are you have experienced this mammal trying to come and eat your vegetables as if that is one of their favorite foods. Um, there are some similar species, not because the species itself looks exactly like the groundhog, but because there are other features that we confuse them with. For example, the muskrat, if you're ever like, why is that groundhog swimming? That's weird. It's probably not a groundhog, it's probably the muskrat and with all of its fur matted down and its small ears and its brown coloration, they can be visually confused. A muskrat though has a very long sleek tail whereas the groundhog has little stubby fluffy tail. And you may also see a tunnel or a raised section of ground that winds around to your garden. A lot of people think that's automatically a groundhog. It could be a mole, except moles rarely ever find the need to come up to the ground. They like to eat the worms and other little soil microbes. So you're not necessarily going to see the mammal itself. You're just gonna see evidence of it. Fun fact of this is that when you hear the word woodchuck, it means the exact same thing as a groundhog, the same species. And of course, like I said, there's over roughly 70 mammals here in Bucks County. Um, these are some local Pennsylvania mammals that have been found in parts of Bucks County before. You have at the top, you've got um, the black bear, obviously. We have a meadow vole. They're very hard to spot, but they are prevalent in wooded areas next to a meadow or a field. Coyotes are crepuscular, meaning they're out at dawn and dusk. So you may see them if you're out at that time. Chipmunks are in the more tinicum area, but they've been spreading a little bit. And then you have the least weasel and the river otter, which you may see along the Delaware River. Now, what is the point of learning all of this other than astounding everyone with your random mammal trivia now? Um, so can I interrupt for one second? Yeah, please do. I have a question um, in, in the chat um, about squirrels and in particular about black squirrels and and do we see them in this area? Um, black squirrels are not necessarily common in this area however a black squirrel is just a genetic mutation uh, called melanism which is kind of like the opposite of albinism you just have saturated melanin pigment uh, making you present complete black fur. There's not a tremendous population here in Bucks County. However, because it is a mutation, it could occur randomly within the population. Cool, thank you. Cool, are there other questions? No, that was the only one that popped up. If people have questions, feel free to put them in the chat. Uh, Marissa, this is Barbara. Hi, Barbara. How you doing? I have a uh, question. Um, I'm starting to catch in my house um, mice that look smaller than the white foot mouse, but it's basically gray. Are those juveniles? They could be. Um, if it still has a white tummy, but is gray instead of tan, that could be the juvenile or baby uh, white footed or deer mouse. Um, they like to be in houses this time of year nice and warm. Anything else? I think we're good. Okay. So in going along with astounding your friends with your random poop trivia or skull trivia, um, 
We have a bio blitz, as Stacy was saying, coming up October 18th to 24th at our property at Bucks Audubon. And it's perfect for social distancing because it's that week long. You can come at any time that the trails are opened on to dusk which also means that you might see some crepuscular animals that you would not see if you came out just in one afternoon. So you might see a wide biodiversity and range of mammalian species or the tracks and evidence of them. So we really would love it if you came out October 18th to 24th. You can register for that on our website. Um, and we will be using for the BioBlitz a tool called iNaturalist. It's an app, uh, very easy to use, very intuitive. You can download it for free on your phone for iPhone or Android. Um, once you open that app and you create your account, if you don't have one already, you can do that to get set up. And all you have to do is kind of take pictures. So as you're hiking around, you're walking around for our bio blitz, or you're at our trails at any other time, you can take pictures and upload them. And as long as you tag the location with where you took the picture, it will add your observation to our project. Um, you can see in this picture here, we have a project called Bucks Audubon Flora and Fauna. And we also have a new project specifically for the Bio Blitz in that time frame. And it's great. Not only can you add your observations, but you can also look at what other people are seeing and say, ooh, they saw that species? Ooh, when did they see it? Ooh, on that date, at that time, maybe I should check out the Bucks Audubon trails at that time as well. Maybe I'll see a fox, or you might see hawks, or whatever cool animals and plants and fungi that you find. So um, please join us. And here's the, the link if you need it for downloading iNaturalist. Um, yeah, and we hope you join us and that you learned something and are now avid crazy mammal people. All right, do we have any other questions in that? Um, we had one other question. Um, it was um, from Elaine about how are things, could, can they get into her attic? How are things getting in your attic? Oh, that's a variety of ways. I'm so sorry. <laughs> um, you could have little holes in the ground that go under the foundation and then they climb up through that. You could have holes in your gutter where your gutter meets the, the roof of the house. That's a really common place for squirrels and bats and mice to get in through. Um, if you have like wooden siding and it overlaps, there may be little spaces that a mouse has created up and under the siding in your house. Um, holes next to windows, under a porch, and then up through there. Really, there's a ton of ways that mammals can get inside. They're pretty clever if they try to be. So if you um, see a, a, like a squirrel or a mouse poking their head out, you can kind of find where the entrance hole would be and you can get that blocked up. All righty. Well, thank you so much, Marissa. This was great. Very, very informative. Um, next week, we're going to be looking at, um, at plants, sort of the non-woody ones. I know last week we talked about trees and shrubs. Um, next week we're talking about um, more flowering plants and, and herbaceous plants. Um, so that should be lots of fun. So hopefully we'll see everybody then. Um, and hopefully everyone will sign up for our bio blitz to come out and, um, and help us do an inventory of all of the flora and fauna that we have at Bucks Audubon. So thank you all very, very much. And we'll hopefully see everyone next week. Thank you, Marissa, very much. You too.